So thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Daniela Piper. I'm Chief of Staff and Vice President of the Digital Transformation Office at the New York Power Authority. The New York Power Authority is the largest public power organization in the country, and um, we generate power from mostly hydro, and we transmit power throughout New York State. I'm very happy to be here. I've been a member of IEEE since I was a student at the City College of New York, and I've sat in on many events like this, and I've been able to take advantage of opportunities to network, to learn about what's going on um, in the industry. I'm an electrical engineer with my focus has been power, and so I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you all, and I hope that you all benefit from this event. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to two outstanding speakers who are innovating and leading organizations that are solving problems and also improving the way that we work and live. Their journey started long before um, they went to college, um, their first job. Um, the competencies that they rely on today were not necessarily taught in school. Taking initiative, being creative, problem solving, taking risks, these are traits that they have embraced. The US Navy SEALs have a saying, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Saying that if you can be comfortable being uncomfortable, you'll be prepared to handle whatever situation comes along in your own life. Now that doesn't mean that you must not be prepared. And I think you all being here is one step towards being prepared to lead. Self-confidence comes from being prepared. And so as you continue on your journey, uh, as you prepare, you can build that confidence. Risk-taking, initiative, these might sound scary at times, and there are moments when they can be. But today our speakers will share with you how they've addressed that, what inspires them, how they approach challenges, how they make difficult choices, how they dealt with failure, how they lead a team, how they stay motivated, what they define as success. So today, I'll be the moderator for a talk that we'll have after we hear from each of the two speakers. So our first speaker today is Samantha Snaves, and Samantha is going to come up. I'll tell you a bit about her. Samantha is a co-founder and catalyst for Re3D, a company built on a community of makers using gigabots to print human-scale objects using recycled materials. Their mission is to create more access to 3D printable solutions worldwide. While growing up in Detroit, Samantha always wanted to be an astronaut, going to every camp, seminar, and clinic that she could as a child to figure out how she'll become an astronaut. Samantha holds a BS in biology, BA degrees in international relations, and Hispanic studies, an MBA with concentrations in supply chain management and international relations, and she's certified as a firefighter in EMTB. Samantha is a 2018 chair for IEEE Entrepreneurship, She's been an active volunteer leader with IEEE's Entrepreneurship Exchange since 2016, and she was the 2017 Vice Chair of Industry Partners for the IEEE Entrepreneurship Steering Committee. So please join me in welcoming Samantha. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. This is a really tough act um, to follow. I did not invent um, a digital camera. and. Uh, you know, I um, actually don't even consider myself to be that great of a leader. Um, so it's uh, an inter interesting position to be in to, to talk about leading. Um, what I can tell you, though, with, with confidence is I've uh, always aimed for the stars. Um, as Daniela shared, I've, I've always wanted to be an astronaut. It's one of my first words. I always told everyone when they asked what I was going to be from a little child that I was going to go up there. And, and I don't know why. There's probably an episode on, on Sesame Street. Um, so I uh, grew up in Detroit and had for the fortune of going to space camp and then getting a book of all the astronauts um, in the U.S. And um, I'm 37, so as a you know, prodigy stood up and uh, AOL, I'd, I'd Google them and, and get their phone numbers to the white pages and, and call them at dinner and say, okay, so what do I do? How do I become an astronaut? And you know, when an eight-year-old calls you at dinner and you're an astronaut, I guess they feel like um, uh, they had a soft spot for me and, and, and said, well, you got to go to college. Um, so I um, figured out how to go to college. Um, I took a little tour around the U.S. as I, as I um, hacked that. And um, about halfway through my college experience, I met another astronaut um, or a couple um, back in Detroit who had provided some mentorship as I was growing up. And, and I said, okay, so I'm going to college. How do I become an astronaut now? And, and they said, well, um, you have to get some research experience. And they encouraged me to, to major in a, in a science degree, which I was terrible at. 
Um, and, and I said, well, how do I do that? And they said, I don't know, ask your professor. So um, turns out, you know, earlier in your career in college, you're, you're supposed to start to petition to get into the lab. And I was a little late for that. So I started applying to, um, reaching out to my network and, and applying for opportunities um, locally in Detroit and ended up at a startup in Ann Arbor. Um, little did I know they were working on this DARPA grant they had gotten. I didn't know what DARPA was. Um, in order to buy a really expensive microscope, a microscope they needed for their, for their laboratory. Um, so it was actually a competing technology to what they did. Um, and the project was, was off to the side and wasn't doing very well. So they let this college student um, uh, work on what was an artificial immune system for the super soldier project. Um, and it turns out about the time I came on, things, things started to go um, a little bit better. And it was at the end of phase one. So the Army came in and said, you should keep doing that, and um, gave us some more resources um, so that the lab could buy another expensive uh, microscope. And, and at this point, they kind of walled me off from the rest of the company and said, just keep the Army happy for the next couple of years. Um, and uh, we made it to the end of phase two, and little did I know, um, in DARPA, phase three is commercialization. Uh, <laughs> so at the end of phase two, I, had, um, I was uh, in a super, super year of college because I'd heard of this thing called Microgravity University um, when I was an undergrad. If you guys haven't heard of it, check it out. Sometimes it's funded, sometimes it's not. Um, and you can basically write an experiment to fly in the vomit comet. Um, so I wrote an experiment, because I was an EMT, to like draw blood on myself to look at blood clotting. Terrible idea, NASA, safety, like shat all over it. Um, but but so to, it's a really cool concept we haven't investigated. So if you find a way to do this like in a safe way that's more practical, um, in the few seconds you're actually in a simulated weightless environment, uh, we, we might consider it. So um, you have to be an undergrad in that program. So I stayed in school longer and took out more loans. Um, <laughs> and, and that worked out. We actually got in. And then uh, you know, with different uh, continuing resolutions and whatnot, uh, the, the program got shifted to the right. So I had to stay in college even longer to technically be an undergrad with my team. Um, so I, I get the chance to fly in the Vama Comet like my sixth year in college as an undergrad and picking up the second degree. And, and um, around that time, you know, the Army had come up and said, uh, you guys should commercialize, commercialize this. You're underspent because you didn't know, silly, that you're supposed to spend all of your grant funds and not brag about being under budget. And um, you, know, you should apply for a couple patents. So, we, so my, uh, my boss at the time uh, and myself got permission from the company to, who quickly booted us out to, to start a spinoff company. Um, little did we know that was actually during the recession, which was starting earlier in Michigan. Um, and that kind of took us around the country as we recruited customers and, and um, sold it in 2009. Um, after Microgravity University, I had a chance to run that experiment more times with other student groups I would come to mentor, got to know some, some friends in the agency, and so when the company was up for acquisition, um, my peers at NASA Johnson Space Center Space Life Sciences invited, us, invited me to, to come and uh, support some really cool initiatives there working on an innovation and big data. That was really cool, um, but the coolest thing about working and supporting um, NASA Johnson Space Center and then NASA headquarters was getting involved with an organization some of you might be familiar with called Engineers Without Borders, NASA Johnson Space Center. And it's so cool because you get to go with like NASA astronauts, who uh, I clearly adore, and scientists and engineers and rocket scientists, and you, you go down to um, supply-constrained areas, and you get to translate lessons learned from living and working in space um, to these environments. So one project that I got inv involved in was um, a solar fruit dehydrator. And it was interesting because when we went to Rwanda, we saw four things. We saw, um, and, then, and then beyond, um, to Central America. You know, I saw a lot of plastic waste. I saw high unemployment. I saw a huge frustration on um, the dependence on others outside groups like us um, that didn't understand cultural fit and the right voltage and all these other considerations. That's why so many of these projects don't work. And, um, and then most importantly, we saw that the people were like super innovative. Around the time, too, the maker movement had stood up, and I'd had the honor of um, speaking, representing NASA, some of these, these efforts. And we had used 3D printers professionally, and, and now some of the people on my team, and my co-founder, Matthew, was using the, a, a little printer bot he had gotten, one of the very first ones, um, at home. And we thought, golly, why don't we just get open source 3D printers for our friends in Nicaragua, and Mexico, and Rwanda, and Uganda, and, and see, let them just make their own stuff, right? Um, so this is what we, we, we set out to buy. And um, this is largely what the market still looks like today. Um, so on one hand, you've got these small-scale systems that are great. The stuff only fits in your hand. It's not super functional. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, they're, they're super expensive even when they're at an industrial quality. And that leaves a huge gap, and now it's like a $37 billion market um, projected to be at uh, 2023. So, um, so I printed a little tiny toilet. <laughs> 
And we proceeded to take, I think, selfies at bars around NASA Johnson Space Center and started to share this concept with our friends to make a, a large-scale affordable 3D printer um, that would eventually be powered by garbage. And um, we shared this online with the Instructables community and the maker community, and we started to get a little following, um, applied to a couple competitions, and then one of them um, finally picked us up. In 2013, it was called Startup Chile. They gave, it, gave us $40,000 to start or scale our idea in Latin America. Um, so I quit my job first and moved to Santiago with a, with a contract with our team that every six months, another one of my teammates would, would uh, suicide from, from NASA Johnson Space Center and on board as well. And um, my co-founder, Matthew, who's brilliant, um, said, I think printing from garbage is really hard, but we can make the large-scale 3D printer quickly. I'm going to do it in eight weeks. So great. I'm flying to Santiago. You build this in your house. Drive it to South by Southwest, because I heard that Startup Chile was going to have a booth there. And I'm going to launch it on Kickstarter and figure out how to do that. And it worked out. It wasn't pretty, um, but the doors opened at the convention hall at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Matthew had, um, had to disassemble the printer because he realized that version didn't fit through his door and then reassemble it live in the convention hall. It was super stressful. Um, but uh, an editor from TechCrunch walks by as soon as the doors open. And I'm, I started this hashtag called Damn You Amazon Payments with Kickstarter online from Chile, like trying to get the thing approved in time. And <laughs> Kickstarter and Amazon finally like, let it go, and this editor from TechCrunch walks by and, and announces that 3D printing has officially gotten bigger than a bread box. We're funded in 27 hours, got a quarter of a million dollars. Um, fast forward a couple years later, we had to figure out how to do R&D as a bootstrap company, um, but did a couple more um, Kickstarter campaigns and some pitch competitions and, and grants and have been able to basically Ponzi scheme and now run a legitimate um, small business we're manufacturing in Houston, Texas. So this is what Gigabot looks like today. Um, starts at two feet cubed, we only go bigger and under $10,000. Uh, we have a commitment uh, as a social enterprise, that's how we see ourselves um, to the community. Everything's designed around what we think our, our peers in these um, extreme use cases might need. Uh, but the, the customers are actually, you know, MD Anderson Hospital, and, and what we found is that people are problem solvers globally, and, and that's a super exciting to us. Um, so unfortunately, we had a little um, blip um, this last fall where our factory was hit by Hurricane Harvey, and then our outpost in Puerto Rico that we'd opened to demonstrate this Technology in an island um, got hit twice within 14 days. Um, and what's fascinating is, you know, you might think that would set back an open source, socially driven bootstrap hardware company um, that's like really in the minority of, of what is um, postured to be a successful business. But, but that's, that's where our growth really began. We won an NSF SBIR uh, for, to, to create a, to modify our technology to be able to print from trash. We, um, won a $1 million prize in Madison Square Gardens for the Global Creator Awards with WeWork and a series of other pitch competitions. We um, were able to um, do first um, 3D prints for the hurricane recovery and then to secure our first com customers in Puerto Rico, thinking about really um, out of the box things. And um, our team came together in, in new ways and, and we opened our, our 7,000 square foot factory. We when we were in Puerto Rico and offering the printer and in Houston for, for individuals impacted by the hurricanes, we started to get exposed to these use cases we'd never thought of before, like scanning real coral reef that was damaged and then printing it um, to be able to recruit, uh, recruit an ecosystem in less than four weeks. And we saw trash that we'd seen all over the world, but now we saw this influx of water bottles coming into both um, Houston, Texas, as well as Puerto Rico, and, and saw how municipalities were struggling with what to do with all this excess um, plastic waste. Um, so that continued to make us more aggressive about modifying the printer to direct, directly accept plastic waste. Originally thought we, we would like repackage it so the printer could take it and then we thought why don't we just take trash directly. Um, so th thanks to some of the awards we won in January and the support from the community and helping us get through those hurricanes it actually turned out to be a really great thing. Um, we had a lot of recognition, we actually got to print the DeLorean for the, the movie that will be coming out in the year, that was pretty cool. Um, and, and, and we did it. Uh, we started off with pellets, and then um, we, we sent the printer up to be validated at Michigan Tech University and launched it on Kickstarter. And, and during that period of time, this last fall, we actually found we could print with Regrinder Flake in and, and four kinds. So we just submitted two peer-reviewed publications uh, we authored last week um, that will be coming out, and, and we'll have some big announcements in, in the next couple months and are, are trying to share everything in an open way. Um, and we've been fortunate, though, to, to get um, some support from the community like Megan Smith, a former CTO from the White House, and organizations like Dell and, and enterprises who are thinking about what it means to lead through impact and what it th means to do good and, and to do well. Um, 
we, we were super confident we could do it because we felt like we had the knowledge, know-how, and network, and two amazing advisors from Silicon Valley you might recognize. But, but more importantly, we were inspired in, um, in our mission by our community, by our, by our product, by what we saw as a real need. And for that, um, to us, is what drives us forward. You know, at, at Re3D's core, there's um, currently no astronauts on our team. Uh, but I think what, what defines us, what defines our company, and what defines our customers and our community is, is we're all explorers at heart. So what I would encourage you to do is, that, you know, whether or not you consider yourself a leader or people are taking your opinion seriously because you're young is just to stay mission-driven, to think about your purpose. And um, I think when you, when you work hard with dirty fingernails and you, do, you run an honest business with a, with a handshake and you do what people believe is inherently right, um, awesome things can happen. And while you may not go to space, um, you may get to take a 3D printer where no man has gone before. So thank you. <laughs>
And I would uh, build a little app with PHP, MySQL, maybe well, most of you guys know all those things. So I built that, uh, started putting in his trucks. And um, his friend then said, oh, I have another 10 trucks. Can you track mine? <laughs> and that's how it got started tracking some of the trucks. But one of the guys at the truck yard show, showed me this device. It was a, it's, it's small, it fits in your hand. I said, what, what does this do? He said, oh, it's a temperature monitoring device that people put on top of the pallet. I said, how do they get the data out of this thing? Well, he said, at the end of the shipment, somebody takes it out, plugs into a machine, prints out a strip chart, and looks at if it actually met the temperature requirements of a shipment. Could be food, could be strawberries, could be pharmaceuticals, could be anything. And I said, oh my God, so this is 2015, and we can't, get a straight, we can't get data like this straight to the cloud? And that's where I got the idea of taking that device that I built, make it in really low power, and put a battery in it, and put a bunch of sensors, like accelerometer, temperature, light sensors. And that's how um, the idea started and started getting some customers, some traction. I was putting some money on my own, and then finally went to VCs. We raised, to date, we've raised five and a half million dollars from venture capital in Boston. Uh, we've uh, signed up amazing customers like Nokia, Merck, Ford, Total, RFS, Desktop Metal, uh, who are tracking shipments. And the idea is tracking base stations all over the world, because they want to make sure that those base stations are getting on time and in, in, in a good condition. Merck's tracking uh, various uh, chemicals, Ford's uh, tracking model cars, Total's tracking mining equipment, RFS tracks uh, antennas and uh, cables. And imagine how many other companies out there globally who need to track stuff. They know where maybe it gets to a port or it gets to the final destination, but they don't know where it is in real time. They don't know if a delay happens, and they don't know in real time if a damage happens. And that costs them a lot of money. So that's what we're helping companies with. And our team has grown. We're almost 15 people now. Uh, one of the empl employees, uh, Rob Weiss, actually is an IEEE member. I think he, gave, he might have given a talk or was in a panel yesterday. And it's been amazing. So this is a, one version of the story <laughs> where you kind of, everything goes great and everything's been amazing and how easy it was. Oh, we can raise capital, we grow the team, we got customers. But what does actually happen? When I started the company, I was doing consulting. I had quit my job. I was doing some consulting for some Fortune 500 companies on wireless communications. I was taking half of that money, putting it into my family, um, which is, I had a wife who was pregnant with our son. He's now uh, two and a half years old. And our, my daughter was three years old back then. Uh, it was really difficult for me at that time just to get up and say, I want to start the company. But I think I totally agree with Steve. If you want to do something, you just do it now, and you act. And I did. Um, it was difficult, but I did it anyways. I really believed in what, what was going on and that this was going to be something that's going to scale. And uh, I really believed in that vision and didn't let that stop me. So we go inside of a truck. I would go and put in this device, as you can see there. I would put it in the truck and hope that it works. I would write some firmware put it in the truck, let it go an hour later. When the truck left, I would get no data. Truck would go for two, three days down to Ohio, up to Maine, in Chicago. I would have to wake a week, come back, go on a weekend. My wife would wonder why am I leaving at 11.30 p.m. because that's when the truck got back and I could go inside of the truck, out of my house, to go to the truck yard, pull my computer, start debugging. And at that moment, I'm thinking, why am I doing this? <laughs> I'm just playing around, uh, but I believed in it. And there's a lot of times as an entrepreneur where a moment like that is going to come to you and you just, you should just go get back a job or go make, go, make, uh, go make a living somewhere and make more money. Here I'm not making any money, but I still believed in it. And you don't want to give up. And that's, that's one thing that if you look at trajectory, how the great things are sometimes is really difficult. And then there's bugs, there's plastics that are melting <laughs> inside the trucks. But it doesn't matter. You just kind of learn on the job. And sometimes I think, you know what? Even Steve Jobs, even Bill Gates, even Jeff Bezos, you don't think they had bugs in their software in the beginning? They had a ton of bugs. I'm sure they still have today. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. You just keep going. Um, it's parts come in, and I used to make some parts come from China, and they would be totally like not working. Maybe one out of ten, so my yield was maybe ten percent if I was lucky. 
It's just a lot of things I had to learn from the beginning. Even I'm an electrical engineer, but when you're trying to commercialize something, when you're trying to mass produce something, when you're trying to actually make it and put it in the field and let it run there for days through different temperatures, you just learn a lot. And finally, we got to customers that actually wanted more, so we started scaling. And you're just trying to have fun. When you have small victories, like this one here, when we build like 100 or so, 100, more than 100 devices, this is Rob and myself at, and, and Rob's basement. And I was building these in my basement. And we were grinding tools. Our 3D printed um, cases were not so good. It was just, it doesn't matter. It was just try to, let's make it fun. Let's, <laughs> you're always inspiring. You always try to make it fun. Because uh, you know that it, this is just a small hurdle. This is just a temporary thing, and it's going to get better. And to raise money, it's not just you walked. I walked into a VC firm, and they said, oh my god, this is amazing. Here's a check. Here's a million bucks. Go do your thing. We had to actually pitch to a lot of VCs to get to the point where we are. Uh, pitched to a total probably of uh, 61 VCs through email or phone calls. We actually pitched 20 pitches to various VCs in their offices with their partners. And finally, we were able to get almost three, but we got two term sheets. So term sheet is something that says, hey, we're giving you this much money. We value your company this much. And um, that was our first uh, seed round of th more than $3 million that we received. But it takes, takes a lot of knocking on the doors because the investors have their agenda. Maybe they don't care about supply chain. Maybe they don't care about logistics. They want to invest in the next Maybe digital camera, or they want to invest in the next Google, but that's not my company. Maybe their timing is not right. Maybe they just finished their fund, now they're doing another fund, and they just don't have any money left. Maybe the, um, so you gotta, you gotta find the right people at the right time with the right kind of idea that, oh, this is the area that we want to invest in, which is a big market supply chain, and want to make a difference there. And we were able to find out of 61 of them, we found two, which is, which is pretty good. It's like sales. You knock on a lot of doors, and finally somebody um, says, oh, this is the right time. I need this product today. When I tried to find my VP of engineering, it took a really long time. I, I didn't want to give up. It's really important when you hire people, um, make sure you hire slow. Because when they come in, it's, it's really difficult for you to understand that this person is toxic or this person is not right. Make sure that you hire slow so when they come in, everything just works out. And that's what I did with the VP of engineering. I'm very proud of that. It took us probably five months or so, 250 applicants. I made a lot of phone calls. <laughs> and I interviewed 17 people in person, four people over and over again, and finally decided on one VP of engineering. Uh, Amos has been amazing. And now, uh, as we've grown, we have now the tracker. This is the tracker right here. It's the second version of the tracker. The ones that you saw were a different picture. So this one, customers can put in the shipment. They'll know in real time where the shipment is anywhere in the world, as long as there's cellular connectivity. And they can get data like temperature, humidity, shock, tilt, light exposure. And it's been really helpful for the customers that I uh, mentioned earlier. And we're doing, on top of the hardware, we're doing also amazing things on the software side, like analytics, so they can figure out where the shipments are going, where there's routes, deviations, um, and, and things like that. But in order to get to this point, what I'm trying to message is, in order to succeed in anything in life, and especially an entrepreneur, when you're starting a business, you really have to be persistent. And persistence pays off, and you want to be not just persistent, 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 but you also want to learn during that time. I learned every VC pitch I made, I learned something new on what I should improve. Every product we made, I learned how we can improve on the next product. Every software update we made, we learned on how we can improve. So be persistent and don't give up. Believe in that vision and just keep going and act. And there's a good story. Uh, maybe some of you have heard the story of Lion and Gazelle. When a... Uh, Gazelle wakes up in the morning in Africa, the first thing it does, it starts running, and it has to run faster than the fastest lion in order to stay alive. And if a lion wakes up in the morning, if he doesn't want to starve, he has to run faster than the slowest gazelle. But the moral story here is that it doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle in this life. When the sun comes up, you just keep running. And it's same 
don't, there's a lot of decisions we make in our life as entrepreneurs. And we figure out, oh, maybe one day I'm going to have the right time. Maybe there's a day when um, I'll get to that title, I become who I need to be, and that's when I start the business. Maybe, oh, my son needs to grow, and my wife needs to get a job. Like, all the circumstances. You don't, you don't have to wait. And the key message is don't let fear guide your life. You guide your life. Thanks. So Samantha is going to join us up on the stage. So thank you again to Kanar and Samantha. So now we're going to have a chat. Um, we're going to be taking questions from the audience, so you're going to be part of this discussion. And so I'll start off with a question. So Kanar, you talked a bit about how you were very patient in selecting your VP of engineering. And so my question is about how you form a team and how you lead a team and how you keep a team motivated. I'll start with Samantha. Um, can you talk a bit about, you know, you, you were driven. You knew what you wanted. Um, but we, we, can't, we, can't, you know, we can't be successful alone. So how did you go about identifying the people that you wanted to work on your team? And how do you keep them as driven as you are? Yeah, so I think it's, um, it's changed over time. Um, with, with this venture, um, we were basically a a club within a club, if you will. So I had worked with um, my co-founder, Matthew, actually in space life sciences. Uh, we were contractors for the same company um, and, and our peers. And then we were also, after hours, volunteering with EWB JSC um, and traveling you know, for up to three weeks at a time in, um, out, outside of uh, the, the space center. So I mean, when you're, you have diarrhea together and you're sharing a composting toilet, <laughs> um, and drinking beer in the hills of Rwanda and you know, solving really tough problems um, for NASA Johnson Space Center back home. You get to know each other really well over the course of, of years. Um, and then um, EWB started to like, kind of kick us out and call us black ops when we started to really run down this, this printer vertical. Um, and so then we had the, you know, this club within a club and then we were sharing this concept on the line and we started keeping minutes and meeting up once a week or once a month. And, um, so the long answer is, uh, I basically co-founded the company with, with our peers, and then we had this you know, contract that every six month, months um, someone would quit their job and come full time, and that meant with like, no salary. And then once we ran out of co-founders, um, uh, when we had done Kickstarter, we got a lot of visibility. People were really excited about 3D printing, and <laughs> we, we uh, realized you know, we had to stand up a factory. And so friends of ours through the space community would come in with their children and just help us like, on the floor, like, start cutting parts, figuring out inventory, staging, shipping, stealing boxes from the back of Kroger's garbage um, to pack the stuff up. And so it was, it was a really a community-driven project. It was our peers and their friends um, who were locally based around us. Um, when some of them wanted to work for us and we realized we had to start um, paying people, our hourly team we paid from the beginning, um, but the rest of our team we said, anyone that'd be in a salary type role, we said you had to work for the company for six months for free. Um, and that was a good litmus test. Um, and then um, as we started paying everyone up front, we um, would do what's called a test project. Currently, we're in hyperscale mode. Um, we're hiring. You have to have a 3D printing background. By that, I mean, I want to see something on your phone you're really excited about you just made recently. Um, but we have all sorts of positions open in Austin, Puerto Rico, and in, in Houston. And, and like yourself, I'd love to chat, chat with you afterwards. We're in a really slow hiring process. So we're OK taking three months to find that perfect person and doing multiple interviews. Um, and we're getting a lot of mentorship from the accelerators we're in and, and how to um, hire effectively. And if you, one of you all end up applying, please give us feedback because we could certainly do it better. Um, so it's, it's evolving, but it all comes down to like really making sure that people drink the Kool-Aid. And I would say our team now, we just had a team retreat in Houston yesterday. Like uh, they really believe in our social mission and that they're making history and you know, they're part of our brand and, and sharing stories and you know, visiting customers in Senegal and um, just really on fire. Thank you. So can I have anything to add to that and, and just to kind of pick up on what Samantha mentioned, which is mentoring. Mm -hmm. How does mentoring help you to be successful um, and how did it shape your development into the entrepreneur that you are today? Um, I would say I've had, I, I, I have mentored but very little compared to how much I've been mentored. Mm -hmm. um, so that has, has made a big difference in my life. I have 
people that I've worked with in the past who have been my managers, my leaders, that I've followed, um, that I call quite often on the phone. And being in a role that I'm in, um, as a founder, as a CEO, even as a co-founder, it's, it's a role that you take a lot of responsibility and sometimes you have to make really difficult decisions. Um, and having mentors who you can call, it's really helpful. So always figure out who your mentor in your life is, whether it's career or life or anyone uh, in that path, I think it's been, it's, for me, it's been really helpful. So um, as an entrepreneur, as somebody who is, you know, your time is very limited, you're constantly being um, challenged in all different directions, you know, technology is changing all of the time. Um, so you're trying to build a product that will be useful to someone, um, hopefully soon, sooner rather than later, but at the same time, technology is changing. So my question to you both is, starting with Kunar, how do you keep up with changes in technology? Um, you know, how do you know that the product you're developing is going to be, how do you ensure that that product is going to be relevant when it comes to market? Very good question. <laughs> um, I think you have to know a little bit about the space that you're in. And for me, I was fortunate enough, I was fortunate enough to be uh, in the wireless space, mm -hmm. so especially on the wireless chip design. So I've put together where the vision of supply chain kind of where, I, I, in the future, everything is going to be tracked. And how is it going to be tracked? It's going to be tracked by sensors. Mm -hmm. And I could see where these wireless chipsets are going. They're just becoming smaller, cheaper, even lower power than they are today. And it's just going to get better. And seeing that, I think you want to be able to, as a technologist and as an engineer, kind of see that intersection. It's not today, but two, three years from now, we're going to be making millions and millions and millions of these devices across the globe. And that's, that's how you, I would say, that's how I see it. <laughs> and Samantha? Yeah, so we are, we're an open source company, and, and we think with selling a platform technology where there's really not a concentrated market that, that works towards our advantage, it also helps us with our social lean. And, and when you think about printing from trash, that's especially helpful because um, there's a lot of different kinds of garbage and different flavors of it and different geographic needs. Um, so we're able to you know, see what, what our customers are in our community are sharing online. Um, and learn from that. We also have a, a commitment to offer lifetime customer support, um, which is great. So people feel comfortable telling us when things aren't working and, and how we could do better. And they're usually pretty vocal about that, um, which is awesome. And then we were crowdfunded through Kickstarter. So you know you can see on Reddit when people are like, hey, this company delivers late and their product sucks, or it's really <laughs> awesome. Um, and um, then you know, in addition to that, um, we really try and design with our customer in mind. So we do customer surveys annually to all of our customers. And because our equipment doesn't expire, um, there's always a path to upgrade. They're continually using it, buying more, um, and giving us feedback. So ultimately, I think it comes to like getting that prototype up. Like, don't make a, don't pay for press and don't make a fancy video. Just get your prototype up on some platform, not your friends, to solicit feedback. And try and be humble and design mechanisms. Not everyone is in an open source technology, but allow people, you know, through forum friends or whatnot, to, to comment because how they're going to use it is, you know, in a way that they're going to define the technology and may or may not be what you had in mind. Um, so just developing, you know, all those outlets to be responsive. We also turn our physical spaces um, into places where the community can drop in and engage, and so that's been um, really informative. And then it just comes down to like being present at events like this and hearing what, what you have to say about the technology, the state of it, and where it's going, and, and learning from each other. Thank you. So we're going to start taking questions from the audience. So we have someone right up front here. Hi, this question is for Kerner. Uh, have you looked at integrating your technology with blockchain yet? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I actually wrote a blog post uh, when the peak of the market was on blockchain, <laughs> when uh, Bitcoin went up to 20K. I wrote a blog post on um, how blockchain and supply chain are going to make a difference. So blockchain, I believe, today it's really difficult to see impacts on supply chains. But in the future, if you think what's going to happen is supply chains will be automated. You're going to order something. In China, it's going to get manufactured. It's going to go into a truck. It's going to get shipped into a port. Port's going to take it, or maybe a warehouse distribution center. It's going to go to a port. It's going to go into a sh ship. That all these trucks, all these ships are sailing themselves, driving themselves, it's all automated. It's going to come to a port in the US, get to another truck, go to the distribution center, come to your house, and in a very automated way. 
And in order to ensure that those payments get made on time, in order to ensure that like, everything is efficient, I believe blockchain is a big um, uh, promise there, essentially around making sure that the data is immutable, number one, so data cannot be altered. So that's one big thing about blockchain. And second is around smart contracts, so that every time there's a transaction or a handoff, there's actually our sensor, for, for instance, could say it arrived there between 1 and 3 p.m. at Best Buy at Walmart. It actually arrived there at good condition. It met all the temperature requirements. It met all the shock requirements. Execute a payment to the shipper or to the manufacturer. And there is no need for someone to open the box and check it and do all that lot of paperwork and get paid later and send emails and paperwork. So it's going to have a, I believe, it's going to have a big impact. Not today. I would say probably three maybe to five years from now. <laughs> okay, we have another question from the back. <laughs> yes? Hello, um, my name is Tom Seal. Uh, thank you for such a nice talk, um, both of you. And uh, my question is focused more on the balance of risk and the technology side. So, we, uh, especially Krunar, um, when you said you started making the chip on your own, and you know fab these days is not cheap. Fabrication, mass fabrication is not cheap. So where do you find that balance, um, like where do you decide that, okay, this idea will work and can go in mass production and needs that investment? So um, I don't know if you get my question, but how do you find that fine balance, fine line was what I'm saying? Um, so just to, to be clear, I didn't design, the, I used to do design chips, but what I did is I actually bought chips in this case. Um, but again, you need mass production. Again, you need to make PCBs. Again, you need to buy these things. Uh, I, like I said, I believed in. I still believe a lot in the vision. I know we're gonna get where we're gonna get to, and uh, I know that in the beginning there's gonna be hurdles. You just have to do it. I think the Nike Moto is the best one. Just do it. In the first time I got. PCBs back, nothing was working. Everything was shorted. So, that, I mean, that's how I look at that's how I look at risk, and, and just keep learning and uh, keep doing it. So we have time for one more question. Good morning. All right, thank you. Good morning. My name's Tim. This is a very quick question for anyone on stage. Um, how did you find your mentor or mentors? How about we start with Samantha? Sure. Um, so I was really fortunate in, in my role at NASA Johnson Space Center and the NASA headquarters because I'd have to bring in speakers sometimes or, or strategic partners. And so I knew my advisors um, from my role um, at NASA JSC and we'd become friends. And they were the first people I called when, when we got a quarter of a million dollars overnight. I was like, oh shoot, <laughs> we're going to need some guidance um, maybe from Silicon Valley because they look great on camera. And <laughs> Um, are, are super wise. So I called my friend Pascal Fanet, who at the time was at Mozilla and then Singularity, and then um, he recommended a, a mutual peer of ours, um, Tom Chi, the Google Glass guy. So, yeah. And Kunar? Um, for me, it was uh, Bitwave, which was a semiconductor company, and the CTO there who went to Norwich University, he hired me, and since then, he's always been my mentor. So I, there's a lot of other people who I find there's other CEOs who build different products. You send emails, you figure out who's there to really help you, um, and you realize these people really want to help. And I fly to their states, I fly to their houses, and just sit down and talk and open up about my problems, and people are willing to help. So, Thank you. So, just be vulnerable. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just add that you know events like this are opportunities for all of us to meet others who are professionals, who may be entrepreneurs, who can mentor us. So especially for students, I think it's important to be part of organizations like IEEE because they provide you with that opportunity from a very early stage. You know, you hear you're hearing from entrepreneurs who've done it, and so you may not have a job yet, but um, you may meet someone at an event who would be able to share with you um, how they went about um, taking on a challenge or being a leader and um, maybe they are in a field that you have an interest in. So I think events like these are a great opportunity for you to identify mentors. So thank you to both of our speakers. Um, we're very happy to have had you here. It was very inspirational. And thank you to the, to the audience for sticking with us. Thank you.